Okay, let's get started today. Um, so last week of classes, so uh, this is the last to last lecture. Um, so everyone uh, has submitted their project proposals. It looks really good. I think everyone's gotten feedback. So just um, if you have questions, obviously office hours or emails are fine. Uh, we'll go over some more project logistics at the end of class on Wednesday. Um, so I'll send out an announcement about that um, just so we know what we're doing. But just as a reminder, um, if you're presenting live, the project will be in this room uh, next Tuesday um, during the final exam period, which I believe is 11.30 to 2.30, okay? And we'll just probably go straight through three hours, maybe a short break in the middle, okay? Um, let me just make sure the recording, yeah, okay. So today we're going to, um, oh, so any questions before we get started on course logistics or uh, what we've covered last time? Nope, all right. Um, so today we're gonna finish up our discussion of functional MRI. Uh, and then we're going to talk about diffusion weighted imaging and diffusion tensor imaging. Um, that's sort of over the last 20 years, that's become a real standard of MRI imaging. And, and so we want to make sure you understand what that's about. And before I do that, I did want to say a few words about the, the pre-lecture quiz. And so um, this is once again, a, a, a sort of a screenshot of what an MRI uh, console looks like. Uh, this is for GE, but it looks very similar for, say, Philips or or Siemens. They all have their own particular thing. Um, one of the things you notice is that, you know, we've talked a lot about sort of the, the resolution and uh, the flip angle. Uh, on um, We haven't talked about slice thickness, so we'll talk about that a little bit on Wednesday. Uh, some years I spend more time on that than others. This year, we're not going to spend too much time on that. Um, but you do notice that one of the things we do set here is the echo time, okay? Um, and in this one, it looks like the the TR, is this TR? Yeah. You see sometimes the TR is basically grayed out, okay? And so there's you're actually not, it, there's nothing in here. So oftentimes it'll be set to a default value or the, the, the uh, pulse sequence program or the MRI um, company has decided that you shouldn't be allowed to touch that. Uh, because they don't want you to ch change that, okay? So one of the problems you had was if you increase the T1 of a, of a material, what should you do? And, and you could either increase T, so you want to increase TR, right? Because you want to move to the average T1. Um, but in terms of if you want a T1 weighted, um, you could increase or decrease TE, right? So you could you could mess with this parameter, but you... But in general, for T1 weighted, you never really want to make this more than the minimum, right? Because in that problem, it's unconstrained. If you increase T enough, then you could just lose all your signal, okay? So in general, for T1 weighted, you always want to, if you can, just keep minimizing your echo time, ideally to zero, because you don't want any T2 weighting, okay? So that's one of the questions. The other one, which um, most questions, a majority of the people get right. This was, I think, the only question this year that... Uh, less than a majority got right. So we're gonna go over this uh, Gibbs artifact, um, simply because it is something that comes up a lot, um, not only in MR imaging, but a lot of um, you know signal processing, image processing. Um, and remember the Gibbs artifact is sort of this ringing that you see in, in an object, okay? And this can be a real issue. For example, if this is the interface of say your cartilage and your knee and, and fat or tissue, and you saw this sort of texture in your knee, you want to make sure it's not actually something wrong with your knee and, and it's actually just an artifact, okay? So in this case, uh, one of the options is, well, you could apply a ram lac filter, which looks like this in terms of case space, right? Um, but this would just enhance the high frequency components, right? And so that really wouldn't help with this because these are fairly high frequency components. So if nothing else, it actually just enhance those. All right. So the problem is you don't have enough, you're missing some high frequency components here that would otherwise fill in uh, those divots. Okay. So, and in the image domain, what's happening is you're convolving this very sharp edge with a fat sink function so that effects are last longer. If I go to higher frequencies, then um, I would have a smaller sink function. Okay. I would still sort of fill in the information that's causing these um, 
these divots, and then there's still some ringing here, but it's much more localized to the edge. Okay, so uh, one of the things that if a technologist sees gives ringing for whatever art, for whatever reason, and typically it could be because the protocol has been set up for a certain um, you know anatomy. And then maybe someone comes in with a metal implant or, or something, a very sharp edge, much sharper than you'd expect to see. And so you might end up with Gibbs ringing in a subject that most subjects wouldn't have Gibbs, rings, Gibbs ringing in, okay? Because it requires a very sharp edge, right, to really enhance it. So in that case, the technologist could just sort of increase the number of phase encodes, increase the uh, the matrix size, or a lot of um, uh, MRI systems will apply some filtering in case space, okay? And so by... Instead of multiplying by a rec function in case space, I multiply by this filter. So instead of a sync function, I get this nice function here. Okay. Uh, and that's probably where some of you got uh, misled. I mean, it is, I, I guess you could consider it a trick question, right? I mean, the RAM lack filter, you can have a RAM lack filter, right? And then you can multiply it by a hamming window or handing window, right? And that would give you something like that, right? Okay. Uh, but in general, uh, let me just say, you will never, I've never seen an option for a RAM lack filter on an MRI console. Okay. So on CT, yes, but in on MRI, that's generally not something you're going to want to do. Okay. I'll say any questions on that before we move on? Okay. So I think those were the two, there were the, the two questions that sort of uh, most people stumbled on were, were the Gibbs ringing and, and the what to do with the TR and the TE. I think most people, this one, I think most people got, everyone got the T2. One and the T1, just remember, um, I guess this isn't the right plot, but basically, um, uh, the thing is, as this frequency, as this Larmor frequency moves up with, with uh, magnetic field strength, this moves out of that sweet spot and you're moving up into this region here. Okay, so you're taking this frequency where there's the most efficient T1 relaxation and just moving it up here. Okay. And so you're in a regime where your frequency is such that most of the particles are oscillating at frequencies that are not where you're at. And you're only interacting with free water. And so that's not gonna be very good at um, letting you sort of dissipate your energy. Okay. So that becomes an issue where, um, you know, typically at three Tesla, where we're at, um, you know, the T1s are, 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 you know, on the order of, um, like a, one and a half seconds for, for lots of tissues. But as people go up to higher and higher field strengths, then the T1s get longer and longer. And so that has an effect. As you're increasing your SNR with a higher field strength, that's good. But if you're waiting for the magnetization to recover, then you're also losing some of that because you're waiting longer for it to recover. Okay. So that's some of the trade offs that MRI physicists have to make when they're designing systems. Okay, so uh, if there's no more questions, let's just review a little bit about fMRI. Um, so obviously fMRI, I mean, I've taught whole courses on this. So uh, in one lecture, I can only touch on the, the highlights. So the, the object here is just to give you a sense of what fMRI does. Um, remember, we're trying to study brain function. And the main thing is the bold signal change. That's the most popular form of contrast. And the idea is in a baseline state, if we acquire some echo time, then our signal will be here. And then during activation, the observation is this relaxation, uh, it, things don't relax as quickly, okay? So this means that the R2 star of A is less than R2 star of B, okay? Basically the relaxation rate has decreased, all right? So we wanna understand a little bit of at least what that means. Uh, typically, people talk about bold signal change, and so it's a sort of the difference in these two signals. So this would be S sub A, S sub B, and you take the difference and you divide by the baseline. So that's your bold signal change. And it turns out that that's equal to echo times times this delta R2 star. So let's review a little bit about what causes change in the relaxation rate with brain activity. So remember, the bottom line is to first order, the most important effect is how much deoxyhemoglobin you have in your blood, okay? In particular, in your uh, in the in the venules, okay? Uh, so the idea is if I have a little bit of deoxyhemoglobin, okay? So the, 
then not too much of the iron is exposed. Okay, so there's some perturbation of the field, and that perturbation will cause some dephasing. And let's say I go into a state where I have a lot more deoxyhemoglobin, so there's a lot more iron atoms exposed. In that case, there's a lot more inhomogeneity in the field. So if spins at different locations around every vessel, we'll get more out of dephased or we'll get more dephased, and that will decrease the MRI signal. Okay. So uh, decreases in signal mean there's more deoxyhemoglobin. An increase in the signal would mean there's less deoxyhemoglobin. So what's going on in your brain, okay? Well, there's really two competing factors. One is uh, you need blood flow, right? You need oxygen to be delivered, okay? And at the same time, you're using up the oxygen, okay? So blood flow is delivering more oxygen, so it will tend to reduce deoxyhemoglobin, okay? But at the same time, you've got metabolism, which is... Um, increasing deoxyhemoglobin, right? Because it's offloading the oxygen atoms, okay? So if these two things increase at the same rate, then deoxyhemoglobin wouldn't change at all, okay? And there would be no fMRI, okay? And so you might imagine nature could have designed the brain to do that, right? Just say, I'm just gonna give you as much oxygen as you need, no more, no less, okay? But especially as an engineer, you would say, well, that's really not a robust system. You know, I don't really wanna it's sort of like um, only having enough gas in your car to just make it like one foot and then just adding gas as you need to go, right? So the brain has set up such that if we look at the percent change in CBF over the percent change in CMRO2, that ratio is typically on the order of two to four, okay? So the brain, it means the brain is super conservative, okay? Especially, and it turns out that ratio is even higher, tends to be higher in like your visual cortex and your motor cortex. You're basically your sensory and motor areas. That ratio is almost like maybe three on average. In areas of the brain, like your hippocampus or, you know, your prefrontal cortex, it's a little harder to measure, but we think the ratio is closer to maybe two or so. So that sort of makes sense. Basically, the stuff that you're using to like think about whether to buy something you know, on Amazon doesn't really need to act that quickly, right? So the ratio doesn't have to be that high, right? Two to one ratio is probably fine for deciding what button you're going to click or, you know, what, you know, whether you're going to upgrade your computer today or tomorrow, okay? But if you're being chased by a lion or a tiger, you probably want your motor and sensory systems to be operating no matter how fast you're running, okay? So that ratio is set up, I think, to really be Make sure you just don't, you don't, you don't just, your brain doesn't just sort of lose it. Now, obviously that's a very simplified picture. There's a lot of stuff going on with your brain. You know, there's the flight, fright, uh, the flight, the flight, fright response. There's a lot of hormones going on. So this is just talking about metabolism. Okay. So uh, this is a nice graphic made by uh, one of uh, former PhD students, which sort of summarizes this really nicely. So. Basically, you can think of blood flow as bringing in oxygen, and then as it's used up, you get more deoxyhemoglobin, okay? And so typically, the MRI signal is determined sort of at the later parts of the capillary bed and the venules, and this is where the perturbation of the magnetic field is mostly occurring, okay? There are some evidence that's already occurring up here, but to the most part, it's occurring down here. So with neural activity, actually, um, you get an increase what happens is you get an immediate increase in metabolism. And actually, this actually leads to an increase in deoxyhemoglobin, and therefore the MRI signal should go down initially. And in fact, if you do very careful experiments, you can actually see this initial dip right at the beginning, okay? But very quickly, the brain says, well, if you're gonna do some work, I better give you more oxygen, okay? So it quickly opens up the arterial, so they dilate and they start delivering more blood, and so there's more oxyhemoglobin and therefore less deoxyhemoglobin and CBF goes up much faster than CMR2 goes up. And therefore we typically see this positive increase in this bold signal, okay? And then after the simulation is over, there is a return to baseline. Uh, it's still not really understood what's happening here. Um, there sometimes is a, maybe a, there can be even a dip in the delivery, 
We're not sure why, but um, this is sort of the typical tape, uh, the shape of, of what the response would look like. Okay. Okay, so let's um, do a quick, and uh, well, let's just do a couple of these. Let me see. Um, we'll set the poll. So let's say we um, we can change our echo time. So how does the bold percent signal change as I, um, yeah, so if I increase, uh, if I increase echo time, does the magnitude of the bold signal increase or decrease? Okay. So, Okay, so that's this doesn't really take much thought. So let's just see what people think. So uh, who says? Uh, so just at the count of three, just say increase or decrease. Okay, one, two, three, increase. Right. So remember, it goes as delta r two star times echo time. Okay. So it increases, right? But what happens if I keep increasing echo time? Can I increase echo time infinitely? No, because my signal is going to go away, right? So at some point you're going to get like zero over zero, right? Or some number over zero or, or yeah, basically you're going to get zero change, right? So you're going to have no signal left. So you're just going to be in the noise. And so typically the echo time, we maximize it when the echo time is approximately equal to T2 star. Okay. So for human brain at three Tesla, that's around 50 milliseconds. Okay. But typically we'll acquire it even less at maybe 30 milliseconds because we don't want to wait around that much. And it's not, we don't get much gain by waiting around. Okay. All right, let's look at the next question. So what happens if I, um, if I increase the functional CBF response? So the CBF response is how much does blood flow increase in response to some stimulus? Like if I tap my fingers, blood flow is going to increase in my motor cortex. What, um, if that percent increase increases, what's going to happen to the bold response? Is that going to increase or decrease? Okay, so think about that for like 10 or 15 seconds and we'll look at that. Okay, so let's at the count of three, just say increase or decrease, one, two, three. Increase, increase right. Because if I deliver more percent increase in blood, right? I'm going to increase the oxyhemoglobin much more. That's going to reduce the deoxyhemoglobin. And so the bold signal will increase even more. Okay, good. And the last one, um, I think we can skip it because it's just going to go the other way. If I increase the metabolic, the CMRO2 response, I'm going to use up much more oxygen, right? So there's going to be much more deoxyhemoglobin. So the bold response will decrease. Okay. Okay, let's actually do this problem. I think this is a this was probably an old test problem or a homework problem. I don't remember exactly. So uh, it's worth looking at. So let's say you have a fMR experiment where the coupling between blood flow and percent change is characterized by a two to one ratio. So that means blood flow increases by a factor of two compared to CMR2. And now what happens if you increase the coupling to three to one? Okay, assuming that the blood flow change remains the same. So the percent increase in blood flow is the same, but now you just have a three to one ratio. So think about what's gonna to happen to the fMRI response. Well, actually, let me launch that for me. Okay, yeah, thanks. I, I have the, the wrong poll. I launched the right poll for you guys online. Let's see, how do I do this? Can go back, arbitrary multiple choice. There we go. 
Okay, let's uh, see. So the count of three, just say what you think the right answer is. One, two, three. C, right. That's right. So basically, if I go from a two to one ratio to a three to one ratio, I the blood flow starts outstripping the metabolism even more. So I will have less deoxyhemoglobin, so the bold response should increase. Okay. What would I need the ratio to be to get no bold response? So if I go to two to one ratio, what would I need to make that ratio to, to get E to be the right answer? Yeah, one to one ratio, right? Okay. Good. Okay. So that's the basic idea behind fMRI. And um, it turns out if you look at this Homer Simpson thing, like when you Google, like, and this, I've, it's been a while since I've done this, but pretty much every topic in this has been studied. Now donuts, if I go to PubMed and do donuts fMRI, I don't find anything, you know, maybe Krispy Kreme and fMRI, I don't know. There's probably something done with donuts, but there is a lot of work done on, you know, uh, fMRI of, you know, obesity, of eating disorders and 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 sort of there, there's a lot of interest in, in how um, to the brain sort of, um, uh, takes care of, of, of eating. So um, that's the closest I could come to donuts. If someone finds something closer, let me know and we'll update this slide. Okay. Uh, I think by far one of my favorite studies, it's not, it's an oldie, but a goodie is this one out of Caltech. Um, quite, a, quite old now, but um, this is the experiment that they did. So basically um, this is an experiment tasting wine. Okay. And so uh, in one case, so the experiment goes like this. You come into the lab and I give you, you know, two containers, each with wine in them. And it's actually the same wine. Okay. But in one case, I told you this wine costs $90 a bottle. And the other case, I told you the wine costs $10 a bottle. And you're asked to rank how much you like the wine. And guess what? You like it much more when I tell you the wine costs $90. Okay. Uh, same thing if I tell you the wine costs $45 or it's $5, you just like it, like almost a factor of two more when you think it's an expensive wine. It's the same wine, okay, but you just like it more, okay? So uh, so they did this experiment also in the MRI scanner. And so you can sort of see here, if we zoom in on this. So this is the bold signal. So the, the x-axis is time, and this is just the percent signal change. Um, it looks like it's in the medial orbital frontal cortex, which is an area that sort of registers reward and pleasure. Okay. So look at this signal here. Um, if I give you a full, if I tell you the wine costs $45, this reward area really lights up and stays pretty high. Okay. If I tell you it's $5, um, it actually lights up, but less. Okay. And there's even this negative response. Perhaps you're disgusted by the fact that you're drinking $5 wine but somehow the reward center is just really not that happy, okay? Um, and so same thing goes on with $90 wine. You get a very robust response when you're told it's $90. And here at $10, you get an initial sort of increase in reward, but it sort of subtly declines, okay? Yes? So is it like after one sip, or like what are the numbers on that x-axis? Oh, this is probably in seconds. So... Uh, let's see, degustation onset. Um, I think that's, they probably sip the wine or something. And then we measure their response as they're like, you know, they can't, maybe they're smelling. I don't know. After, you know is it, are there any wine tasters here? Okay. So anyways, you know, when you taste wine, I guess you, you sort of evaluate the wine, right? Okay. Um, so anyways, I thought that that's a really nice study. And uh, just so there's lots of really interesting studies out there using fMRI. We've learned a lot about uh, how the brain works over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, oh, I guess this isn't updated. Uh, the other thing that we can do um, that people are starting to do is, um, and this is actually not the latest, but the idea is there's a lot of interest in mind reading. Okay. So basically, can I put someone in a scanner or ultimately, um, you know, can I monitor the brain in any sense and um, can I try to see what you're seeing? Okay. Um, so this is one where what you're going to see is they're going to show you, is this going to be the movie that they're actually watching? Does anyone know who this is? What did you say? Yeah, Steve Martin. Yeah, good. Okay. I mean, it's an oldie but goodie. I mean, it was 
I guess it was came out before most everyone here except for me was born. But uh, you know, it it's you know, Steve Martin is obviously a legend. Uh and then this is sort of what I think there's a movie here to play. So let's see. So you can sort of see it's not perfect, but and it's showing different pictures here, and this is what it's decoding on the left side. Okay. So, you know, it's not perfect and sometimes it hallucinates, but, and I think this will probably get better with deep learning. This was done before the heyday of deep learning, but the idea is there is enough information in the bold signals to start figuring out what people are thinking, okay, and seeing. And I think there, one application of this, um, whoops, is that you could, um, you know, if you, you apply this to uh, people with like locked in syndrome or people with comas or people who can't really respond. And so there's interest in whether you can put someone in the scanner and see what they're doing, even though they can't, you know, move anything. Okay. So they'll typically, you know, one experiment you might do is you might, you sort of, you might ask them to imagine something, an activity that you know that they used to do and sort of see if they're actually doing that, if they're actually imagining it. And that way you could actually tell whether their brain's still working, even though they can't respond, okay? Um, these are just, uh, this is from 2018, so a little more recent, but essentially uh, the idea is these are the pictures that you're supposed to decode. And, you know, you sort of see it does a pretty good first order job of decoding what it is, what it should be. I think this is only gonna get better with time, um, but, you know, it's it's reasonable, right? Okay. Uh, the other thing you can do, uh, it's sort of a cool idea. This hasn't really taken off, but you can also do real-time fMRI. And so this, the idea is that um, I can lie in the scanner. And what I want to do is I want to modulate, for example, here's the task. I want to modulate the my activity in a certain part of my brain. Okay. So let's actually do that experiment now. So I want all of you, uh, you can keep your eyes open or closed, but think very deeply. And I want you to increase the blood flow in your brain to your insula by 20 percent okay everyone doing good okay now i want you to decrease the blood flow to your amygdala by 30 percent okay how's that working for you okay so it's not that easy right because there's no feedback right whereas I, if i tell you to move your hand there's a lot of feedback so you know what to do right um so the idea is maybe you can use the fMRI machine to give you feedback. Like I put you in the scanner and I show you what your level is and I say increase or decrease that level. It turns out people can actually do that, okay? You can actually show someone the fMRI signal in the brain and you tell them decrease it. And if they get feedback, they can decrease it and then they can increase it and they can decrease it and they can actually decrease it. So just like everything else, if you're given feedback, you can actually learn how to do it, even though you don't really know what you're doing, but the brain just sort of says, okay, I'm going to try to uh, do whatever that feedback is telling me to do. Okay. So there was a lot of hope for this in the early days that, you know, maybe we could use this to, you know, teach people how to deal with their pain, you know, mo you know modulate the areas that have pain or um, in like addiction, could we look at the areas that light up when people you know, are craving something and, and um, um, it hasn't really worked out too well simply because it's, you know, it's a tough experiment to do and you can't have, it'd be very expensive to have someone in the scanner every day for an hour a day. So there's probably just not enough time to train them. Uh, the other thing is that I think as all, as all of us know, the brain is, is pretty tricky. So if you try to get it to do one thing, you'll just find another way to do the same thing. Okay. So I think that's why it hasn't worked out. So the last topic we're going to talk about is something that sort of, um, you know, is a little different than what we've talked about so far. So, so far, we've really talked about what's called task-related fMRI. And that's simply, if I ask you to do a task, then the fMRI signal will pretty much follow that task. Okay. But what if I ask you to do an experiment where I just said, why don't you just lie in the scanner and I'm just going to scan you and just you can close your eyes or open your eyes or just, just lie there and do nothing. And if I measure your signal, um, basically it looks just like random patterns going through. So that's what your, your brain would look like. Um, 
And if I looked at a signal in an area of the brain, it would pretty much look like sort of random noise. Okay. So let's think about two different experiments. Here's an experiment here where I had the, the subject tap their fingers in a certain pattern. And I looked, I correlated this pattern with their brain signals. And I found out that these are the voxels, which are the motor cortex that are doing that finger tapping. Okay, so that's sort of traditional fMRI. Now here's an experiment where I just had the person lie in the scanner, okay, and not do anything. And if I looked at the signal, say, in this part of the brain, let's call that the left motor cortex, maybe I get the green signal, okay? And it turns out if I look at the signal on the other side of the brain, I get the blue signal, and they're highly correlated, okay? And so it turns out if I take a signal from this part of the brain, and correlate it with the rest of the brain, I get a pattern that is almost identical to this pattern, okay? So this is what's known as resting state bold connectivity. Uh, it has a really interesting history behind it. Uh, this observation was first made by Bharat Biswal, who was a graduate student. This was in the mid 1990s, okay? And this was his PhD thesis, right? And um, the story goes, I believe this paper was rejected three or four times. Okay, no one believed it was true. Uh, I think he was pretty depressed, right? I mean, imagine you're doing a PhD thesis and everyone says it's just fake. Um, and eventually it was accepted. His, his advisor was you know, influential enough that he was able to get it published. Um, this has now become one of the most cited papers in fMRI. Um, it's now the basis of probably, and I just probably spent a billion dollars maybe using on, on studies using resting sync functional connectivity. Uh, because it's such an easy experiment, right? You just put people in the scanner and you sort of look and see how their brain, different parts of their brains are connected, okay? Uh, so for example, this is one experiment that one of our grad students did where um, if you look at, these are the two maps I showed you before. And then simply what she did is she gave all the subjects 200 milligrams of caffeine and showed that you could sort of reduce this functional connectivity in the brain, okay? Since then, um, people have gone on to discover many, many other networks. Uh, the most famous one is called the default mode network, but the one I just showed you was the sensory motor network, the visual network is another one. So it turns out that your brain is always talking to itself, okay? Which makes sense, right? I mean, it's sort of like your brain, like your car, if you have your car idling, then you can move much more quickly. You don't have to start it up. So the brain is always sort of in, in a background mode taking care of itself, basically doing all the things it thinks it needs to do when you actually do an activity and making sure those areas are connected. Okay. So it turns out that um, this now is the basis of you know, a lot of studies. This is just another study from our group where it turns out that in this study, we took some data and we showed that if you just put someone in the scanner for and you just took like 20 seconds of their data, and let's say you had a hundred different people and you looked at their connectivity patterns, uh, you could pick out who's who, right? So if I put all of you in a scanner today and um, scanned you, right? And I looked at your connectivity patterns and I brought you back tomorrow and scanned you again. And then you gave me you know, the data from day one and day two, I could actually pair, I could Id identify everyone in this room just based on that, on 20 seconds of your data. So it turns out how your brain is connected is essentially like a fingerprint, okay? So everyone's brain is connected quite differently. Um, so uh, I don't think I put it in these slides here, but essentially um, there are major uh, studies. The most famous one is the Human Connectome Project. So if you wanna Google that, that's sort of really sort of use this um, to really sort of advance our understanding of how the brain is connected. It's a massive paper. It's like, I don't know, the, the supplementary information is like 200 pages long. Again, though, I mean, to, to, to sort of keep on with the theme of fMRI, the first author, Matt Glass Glasser, that, that was his PhD thesis, okay? So it's a nature paper uh, using data to sort of identify how the brain is connected. Okay, so that's really a very, just only a taste of what fMRI can do. Uh, any questions before we move on? Okay. So let's talk a little bit about um, moving spins. And so today we're gonna talk about 
um, diffusion imaging. Um, and then uh, on Wednesday, we'll talk a little bit about imaging of flow. So, so far, we've assumed that spins are not moving, okay? So contrast is based on T1 and T2 and proton density. And we talked about how using T and TR we can use to adjust our image contrast, right? Uh, but most biological tissues of interest that are alive have things moving in them, right? So uh, for example, blood flow is one we talked about a little bit. Um, today we're gonna talk about diffusion of water, okay? And that turns out to be something that's really important for clinical MRI imaging and also research imaging. Okay. So just to remind you, what is diffusion? Diffusion, if I uh, sort of the classic experiment, where I put, put, put a bunch of particles and drop them into water, they're going to just randomly spread out, right? Just due to random motion. Okay. So it turns out that you can think about a random walk. So for example, if I start off with a particle here, it's gonna sort of do a random walk. And if I look at lots of particles after many steps, uh, if they all started at the same point, they will have spread out, okay? And this is basically how far they spread out. The standard deviation is related to the square root of two times D, where this is the di diffusivity Okay, how diffuse, how how likely are things to diffuse times time and the square root of time. So if I look at different time steps, essentially things spread out more and more as I wait. Okay, so intuitively we we sort of have experienced that. Uh, Einstein, uh, you know, basically was one of the first to describe this and basically showed that this mean square displacement, which we just talked about, is equal to two times n times this diffusion coefficient times time where N is how many dimensions are in this space, okay? So that means the way, the longer I wait, the more things displace in time. So what we wanna do is ask the question is, can MR, is MR sensitive to this process at all, okay? Because if it is, then we can actually start measuring diffusion, okay? Uh, these are just showing in 1D, it spreads out like this. In 2D, it would spread out like this. And in 3D, we imagine things spreading out over a 3D sphere. Okay, okay so how are we gonna measure this with MR? So let's review a little bit about what an MRI system has in it. So the part that's really important for diffusion uh, are these gradients, okay? So remember the gradients allow us to have linearly varying magnetic fields, okay? Either in the X direction, the Y direction, or the Z direction, okay? but it's always the BZ component that we're talking about. And so remember, um, we use it for imaging. Now we're gonna use it for diffusion. If I have a gradient, so this is a positive gradient as a function of X, and this is the isocenter. So we assume that that's our reference point. Spins here are gonna process faster, right? And spins here are gonna process slower, all right? So now we want to see how can we make use of this gradient field to sensitize our um, acquisition to diffusion. Okay, so this is experiment here. So this is a thought experiment we want to do. Let's imagine we have two spins at some location X. Okay, at time equals zero, they're in phase. Okay, and then I apply a gradient and I leave it on for some amount of time. Okay, so if they just stayed here, right, then this is a lower... This is a negative gradient here. So these spins would tend to go counterclockwise, right? They're slower than the spin here, right? But these spins don't stay in place, they move, right? They're just randomly moving around during my experiment, right? So this spin, the black spin here in the black circle moves into a place where things are even more negative. So it's gonna lag, go counterclockwise more than if it had stayed here, okay? This spin here randomly moves into a spot where the field is less strong, and so it's not going to process as much, okay? So now you sort of see these two spins that were in phase get out of phase, okay? Now we reverse the experiment and we change the field such now we have a positive gradient, okay? 
So ideally, if the spins had stayed in the same place, anything we had done, we can reverse it, right? Just like when we have a gradient, the redock gradient, you know, when it goes negative and positive, it has net area at some point, right? So we could totally reverse the phase. But if the spins are moving around, that's not going to be the case. So this, for example, this spin in the black circle keeps moving along this direction, let's say. And so he moves into a strong positive area. So instead of just being returned back to normal, it overcompensates and sort of overshoots, okay? It, it spins much faster than it needs to, to compensate for what it accrued. And this spin here um, almost makes it, but sort of also overshoots a little bit because it's moving back into, it experienced this field, but now it's experiencing this field. And so the idea is, by diffu with using diffusion and gradients, um, I can sort of take things that are in phase and make them out of phase, okay? And the more diffusion there is, you can imagine these are moving into even farther parts of the, um, farther out in air in space. And so I would expect even more dephasing the more diffusion there is, okay? So the MRI signal, okay, will tend to go down as the diffusion goes up. Okay, because this will be more dephasing. Right. Uh, so this is what a very simple diffusion experiment looks like. We apply a 90 degree pulse where we flip all the spins and they're all in phase. And then we apply a diffusion gradient for a little amount of time in one direction. Okay. So uh, without diffusion, these would respond to this field. So this would lag behind, this would go forward. And then at some point in time, we wait and we refocus it. Okay. So if the spins don't move, then this net phase is compensated by this net phase of this gradient. So you notice here, basically, um, when I apply this, things are completely rephased if things don't move. Okay. But now with this diffusion gradient, with diffusion, Imagine this spin here decides to move over here, okay? So it's going to move into a stronger part of the field, so it's going to overcompensate. So now it's going to be out of phase with these spins that didn't move, all right? So it's the same idea, uh, just a different schematic, more dephasing, more diffu with di more diffusion. Um, so it turns out that the signal, and all we're going to talk about today is this equation here, okay? And this is what's known as the B factor, okay? So when you sit down at an MRI console and it's a diffusion sequence, typically you'll see uh, a field for the B factor, okay? And so it's for like a lot of clinical imaging, that B factor, for most clinical images, a sweet spot is gonna be 500 to maybe 1,000, okay? And we'll talk about what that means in a little bit, but that B factor is basically how sensitive are you are to diffusion, okay? So one of the things that makes you more sensitive is if I have a weak gradient, okay, versus if I have a strong gradient, okay? So I'm just basically increasing the gradient amplitude here. This will tend to have an increase in B factor, okay? Because basically this, because I'm causing more, uh, a stronger change in dephasing, then this will have a stronger B factor as I increase the gradient strength. So that's one of the the, uh, the knobs that we have, that MR physicists have, is we can change the gradient strength to, in to increase our sensitivity to diffusion, okay? And you can sort of see that here in these equations for B factor, this gradient amplitude comes in as a G squared term, okay? So in fact, if I double the gradients here, this B factor will go up by a factor of four. Yes, question. Right now we're talking about the water molecules. Yeah. Primarily, I mean, you're, you're, you're essentially, for, for what we've talked about in this class, we're primarily always talking about the hydrogen protons, okay? And then, um, so like, for example, when we talk about fMRI, even though we talk about the, ad the iron atoms, we're not measuring directly the iron atoms. We're measuring their effect on the precession of the hydrogen protons, okay? 
Now, I'm not sure if any projects are doing spectroscopy, but there is an area where you can look at other metabolites, okay? So for example, we talked, I think in the first lecture, you can sensitize yourself to other atoms such as phosphorus or sodium, but those tend to have very low concentrations. So it's very difficult. You know, clinically, they're just not as, as, as viable. Um, the other thing you can do is spectroscopy where the hydrogen atom, depending on like if it's attached to a different molecule, will have a slightly different Larmor frequency, okay? And so you can sensitize yourself to measure different metabolites, uh, but those also tend to be low concentrations as well. So it's just a tough, tougher to do it, okay? Yeah. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how diffusion-weighted imaging works and look at some clinical applications. So this is an example of actually what the MR image looks like as I increase the B factor from 100 to 287, all the way up to about 1400. And so you sort of notice overall things get darker, right? So there's diffusion everywhere, okay? Um, but if I look at this voxel here, it's decreasing much faster as I increase the B value versus this voxel in blue, okay? And remember the signal goes as E to the minus BD, okay? So that means that this one much has a higher diffusivity than this one, okay? Because the same B value, over B values, um, it's, it's decreasing much faster. So then typically you can come up with what your estimate of diffusion constant is. So for this one that didn't decrease very quickly, the diffusion map is dark because it doesn't have much diffusion here. Whereas it's uh, fairly uh, bright here because uh, the diffusion is saying there's more diffusion here, okay? And in fact, here in the ventricles, there's a lot of diffusion because it's just water, free diffusion of water moving around, right? So this is not an MRI map that you get just off the scanner in terms of K space. This is actually taking all these things. So each of these was reconstructed using all the K space principles we talked about. Then you post-process it to get this image, okay? So typically, uh, diffusion scans will be slightly different than typical scans in the sense that uh, one of the things the doctor might want to see is, is what's called a diffusion map, okay? Uh, and so why, why might you want to see that? Well, um, this, is, this is like a T2-weighted map. And if you look at this subject here, um, it looks pretty normal, right? If this person, I mean, I'm not a radiologist, but you know, it doesn't take the radiologist to say that this looks quite different from this, right? So this person obviously has something quite different going on with their diffusion weighted map, okay? And so here you notice the signal is very bright, okay? That means there wasn't much diffusion there, right? The signal didn't decay um, with diffusion weighting. And in fact, the ADC map stands for apparent diffusion coefficient, which is our estimate of diffusion. It appears quite dark here. So that means that there's not much diffusion here, okay? Uh, here's another example where, uh, once again, the T2-weighted image, there does seem to be something going on here. It is a little brighter, right? So without knowing anything else about this subject, we might say, well, maybe there's just more water here or something, because remember, water has a very long T2, okay? Maybe there's some swelling, maybe there's some edema, but, this would certainly be enough difference for the radiologist to look at it more closely, but it's still something where they may not be able to make a diagnosis. But now look at this. This is a diffusion weighted image. This just lights up, right? The diffusion is clearly impaired in this area, okay? And then if they go on to do an angio, which we'll talk about on Wednesday, you notice that this blood vessel here that's supposed to supply this part of the brain has been occluded, okay? So this person has had a stroke, okay? So what happens? Well, this turns out to be sort of still a bit controversial, but it's it's sort of clinically, it's, it's a sort of fairly consistent observation that uh, once tissue dies, okay, if you have, if your brain tissue dies after a stroke, um, then the diffusion tends to go um, up, okay? Or the, sorry, the diffusivity decreases, right? So there's less diffusion. And that means that there's just less water movement in dead tissue. And why is that? Well, one of the hypotheses that people are, are sort of positing is that, you know, um, in live tissues, it's not just random motion of water. There's a lot of active transport of water right across the cell membrane and within the cell, 
So probably, and that's all going to contribute to what you looks like diffusion. And so essentially, once the cells have died, then there's not going to be this much active transport of water. Okay. So even though we've talked about this as measuring the random motion, anything that causes, you know, sort of motion, not even due to diffusion, but anything biological that causes motion that, you know, if you think of a lot of cells, active transport will appear pretty random, right? Because every cell is sort of doing what it does. Okay. So in this case, so typically, so from a clinical point of view, um, it's sort of interesting. Like you would ask, well, does everyone with a stroke get an MRI? And the answer is no. Okay. And the reason why is because if you have a stroke, the first thing they're going to give you is a CT. Okay. Because you come to the emergency room. First of all, as you saw, a CT can, can be done like that. Right. So it's, it's a no brainer. And if you have a stroke, you don't care about radiation, you know, and they want to triage you right away. Okay. So, and the other thing is that, you know, if you've had a stroke, you may not be able to respond to questions. And so when they ask you, have you had any surgery? Do you have any metal? Are there any contraindications to MRI? You may not be able to answer and there may not be anyone there to answer you. So from an emergency point of view, you're going to go right to CT scan. Okay. Now, once you've stabilized or maybe after a few hours, you know, if they want to do some follow-up studies, um, they might go to MRI because then they can sort of start asking, okay, is the tissue viable? If we sort of unblock the tissue, unblock the vessels, can we restore the tissue? So there might be more information that MRI can give for sort of post. There's the, the really acute stage where it's CT, but then as it's less acute, then the, the radiologists or the physicians may start to think about MRI to get more information. Okay. Okay, so any questions about that part? Okay. So the next thing we're going to talk about is what's called anisotropic or restricted diffusion. So what I'm going to show you here, this is a movie from YouTube where imagine I have a tube, right? And there's water sort of everywhere, but there's some water in the tube. And notice there's free diffusion outside here, but obviously there's a barrier here. So every time it hits the barrier, it comes back, right? And here, if it comes here, it's gonna bounce off the barrier, okay? So if you look at the spins or the particles, they can move more freely along this direction than they can along this direction, okay? So if we look at diffusion, we can argue that there's more diffusion this way than this way, right? So this is an isotropic diffusion where there's a certain directionality to the diffusion. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on there. I guess they're breaking it open there. Okay. Okay, so what hap how do you get restricted diffusion in biological tissues? Well, as we talked about, for example, you can have, you can be within, like let's say there's a tube. So for, for the brain, the most sort of where this occurs mostly is in the white matter tracts. So most of you know you have nerves, you have axons, okay? They're surrounded by myelin, okay? And so that's sort of, you have essentially, to first order is essentially a tube where the, the water is not gonna be able to go past the myelin very easily, okay? And so you're gonna have diffusion that's going to be sort of impeded within every fiber and also between fibers. So if you think about this, as it's trying to go through, as it hits these, uh, myelin tracts or the, these axons, it's going to sort of bounce off. Okay. So there is going to be a certainly directionality where water can diffuse more easily along the path of the fiber versus against the path. Okay. So that's why uh, it's interesting. Essentially, you can imagine that if diffusion was just isotropic, then it's still interesting, right? Because as we saw with stroke, it changes with disease, right? But for actually mapping things, what makes it really interesting is I have, imagine here, I have um, an axon here, a myelated axon, relatively free diffusion along this direction, restricted diffusion along this, okay? And so the conclusion is diffusion is anisotropic in white matter. Okay. So imagine the diffusion here, free diffusion is gonna be an isotropic, and an anisotropic diffusion, there's going to be a preferred direction uh, where water will more likely go this way versus this way. So how do we measure that with MRI? Well, remember, we have these gradients, 
right? We have an X gradient, a Y gradient, and a Z gradient. And we can play them in any order we want and any combination we want. So actually we can sensitize ourselves to diffusion in any direction, okay? So for example, if I turn on a horizontal gradient, that's only gonna sensitize myself, sensitize it to uh, diffusion in the X direction. So there's gonna be signal loss along with diffusion along this direction, but actually it's not sensitive to any diffusion in the vertical direction. There's no signal loss if it's diffusing purely in the vertical direction, okay? But if I turn on the vertical gradient, now I'm sensitized to diffusion in the vertical direction. I'm not sensitized to diffusion purely in the X direction, all right? So you can actually see these on some images here. Let's take a look at this spot here. So here you see a lot of signal loss right here, okay? When the, when the gradient's going this way. Here I make the gradient go this way, the signal comes back, okay? And here I made the gradient go right through perpendicular to the plane and the signal is also quite strong, okay? So the conclusion from that is the fibers must be running this way. In fact, there is a white matter track that runs like this, okay? So that's sort of the basis of what's called diffusion tensor imaging, where we start trying to say, well, we want to actually be able to map how the fibers are connected in the brain. Uh, and you can also apply this to anything, um, but the brain is the, is the most, um, one, of the, one of the most uh, widely used areas here. So once again, here, a gradient going left to right, okay, versus what's called anterior to posterior. Here, let's just look at one example. Here, it's pretty dark, right? But here, it's pretty bright. So we know there must be preferred diffusion. There must be something going along this way, and it's not going this way, okay? Um once again, sort of this is that same white batter tract. And so you can sort of see here, it's dark here, but bright here, right? So we, we can sort of start mapping out the diffusion is the tract is probably going like this. Okay. And so there is a white matter tract that just goes along here. Okay. So we're just going to give you sort of a sense of what we do. So this is what's called diffusion tensor imaging, DTI. So if you're in the clinic or in research and you hear the term DTI, this is just gonna, we're just gonna give you a flavor of, of what's going on here. So the idea is previously we had a very simple model, S equals or is proportional to E to the minus D times D, right? Where D was just a number, okay? But now we're saying D, so in free water, that's sufficient. You just have one number to characterize diffusion. And if you wanna actually start mapping out for directions, then you need to make D at least like a matrix, right? And in this, it's and a matrix is just a specific case of a tensor. So they actually call it a tensor. Um, and so now the signal is going to be related to your what's called your 3D diffusion tensor, which you're trying to estimate. And then these are unit vectors representing which way your gradients were pointed. Okay. So basically, and this is a B value, sort of an overall scaling factor. And this, so you can control this, okay? So you know the B value of your of your sequence, you know the direction of your gradients, and so, and you measure your signal, okay? And you can measure this signal by not applying any gradients, and therefore you can then measure this diffusion tensor, and you can char characterize the diffusion in the different directions. All right, so let's just take a look at that. Um, so this is the tensor you're trying to measure, okay? So the diagonals is saying what's diffusion along the X, Y, and the Z directions, okay? The principal directions. And the DXY, DXZ, DYZ are sort of these off diagonal diffusions, okay? And so it turns out that um, this is symmetric. So you only need to estimate one, two, three, four, five, six numbers, okay? So therefore, you know you need at least six measurements. Right, and typically we'll do seven, okay? Because there's an overall scaling factor out here as well, okay? And then once we do that, um, we get what's called a diffusion tensor ellipsoid, which sort of gives you the shape of diffusion. And so you can sort of see in the ventricles where there's mostly water, it's very isotropic. In gray matter, it's thought to be fairly isotropic, although there's research showing that it may not be. And then in white matter is where you get these sort of long cigar-shaped diffusion um, uh, ellipsoids. And you can sort of start seeing, if I know the direction here and I know the direction here, maybe I could start mapping out how things are flowing or how things are wired up. Okay. 
Uh, so here's a very simple picture where if I want to measure, if I want to estimate something like this, right, then, um, you know, I, I, I sort of two measurements isn't, is, is sort of maybe not quite enough because there's a lot of things that could fit this, right? Could this, these, these are sort of representing how much diffusion I have in these directions. It could be fit by this or be fit by this, right? So I need actually at least three measurements to characterize this ellipsoid. Okay, but in fact, we'll do many, many more measurements than we need to because then it becomes more robust to sent to measurement error. Okay, so you'll see in diffusion tensor imaging, uh, even though we may only do seven directions, there are reasons uh, that we'll go into where the clinical exam might do thirty directions or fifty directions or even a hundred directions. Okay. Uh, the bottom line is we are still trying to estimate these parameters. And if you sort of remember back a little bit to your linear algebra, you know, you can always figure out the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of any matrix and diagonalize it, right? And that gives you the principal directions of that vector. So typically we will estimate the eigenvalues, the lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, and the eigenvectors V1 and V2, V3. The principal eigenvector basically tells you what direction that ellipse is going, okay? So if I have an isotropic ellipse, the, the eigenvalues are all about the same. There's no preferred direction, okay? So I don't really even care what the eigenvectors are here because there's no preferred direction, okay? But I've had an, an isotropic voxel, then there's gonna be one eigenvalue that's typically the biggest, okay? And so I care a lot about the eigenvector associated with that eigenvalue because that's gonna tell me the direction where there's the strongest diffusion, okay? So to first order, um, we at least want to know what that primary eigenvector is and what direction it's pointing. Um, and this is just showing you, for example, that these are all ellipsoids that are just pointing in different directions, okay? So if you look at the eigenvalues, they're all the same, two, one, okay? But they all have an eigenvalue that's the biggest, okay? So what I really care about here is the vector so here it's pointing one, zero, zero. So it's pointing along here. This vector is pointing along this way. Okay, this vector is pointing along this way. And this vector is pointing along this way. So it's really that primary eigenvector that we care about. Um, and then here, we're going to come up with um, the trace. It's sort of the overall diffusion and it's the same for all of them, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, okay? Because they're all the same shape. So it's just which direction they're pointing, all right? Okay, so let's talk about what sort of a, um, a diffusion DTI experiment looks like. So we'll typically acquire one measurement uh, with a very small B value, okay? And then we'll acquire other measurements. So this should look much brighter than it does. I'm not sure why it's not brighter. And then here are where we're turning on the gradients. So X gradient, Y gradient, Z gradient, X and Y gradients, X and Z gradients, Y and Z gradients. And then from these, we try to estimate the diffusion coefficients by solving an equation like that, okay? So this is just, I'm saying, this is what I want to estimate. I plug in these values, okay? And I try to, I measure it at each point, and I'm going to estimate all these values. And just like what we did with block equation, we can rewrite this as a linear system of equations, okay? And so we can write, we have these unknowns, we have our measurements, and we have our B values, and it turns out without going into the math, we can actually solve for this linear system of equations, okay? And so that's essentially what diffusion tensor imaging is doing. Once again, you're sort of seeing how, um, you know, it also it just boils down to, like a lot of things in life, it just boils down to linear algebra, okay? Okay, so let's talk a little about what the, what we get out, okay? So, um, so here's a T2 weighted image, okay? And what I'm going to focus on for this slide is what's called a very thing that's used a lot. You'll hear this term a lot is the fractional and isotropy map. So FA stands for fractional Okay. And so this is if you get like a DTI scan, this will be probably one of the scans that comes out for you. The, the scanner will probably calculate this for you. Essentially, this just tells you how unequal are the eigenvalues, 
Okay. So this is the equation. You can sort of see it's it's subtracting all the eigenvalues from each other. Okay. So if they're all the same, this is going to go to zero, right? And if they're not, it's going to be some, the, the more one is dominant, the more this is going to get bigger. So you can sort of see on this map, essentially the FA values are all really strong in the white matter. So this is a beautiful depiction of all the white matter in this person's brain. You can sort of see really strong diffusion for this fiber going this way. Okay. Uh, the other thing we're going to talk about, but we need to set it up, is the color map. Okay, so these are typically the two main things you're going to get out of a diffusion image uh, weighted in, uh, DTI scan. Okay. But before we go there, let's look at the NFA map. And so, for example, here is a patient with uh, some degeneration of their cortical spinal tract at the level of the pons, um, which is in the brainstem. And so, if you look at the T2 weighted image, right? looks pretty normal, right? I mean, I can't, I mean, I'm not a radiologist, but, you know, it would be hard, you know, to say that there's anything really striking about this. Okay. And similarly, if I just look at diffusion, there's really nothing here. Okay. In terms of the overall diffusion. Okay. But if I have an FA map, all of a sudden, it's pretty clear that this side is very different from this side, okay? So there's clearly something, if there's fibers here, there's clearly something different about the, the distribution of fibers here. And, and so this would indicate that this, there's some fiber breakdown on that side of the brain in the brainstem, okay? Because now the FA is very low, much lower than on, on, the, on the correct side of the brain, okay? The interesting thing though, is the overall diffusion of these two sides is the same, okay? So this has just gone from, one, the healthy side of the brain probably had most of its diffusion along the fiber, and the destroyed part has it now just freely distributing, but overall diffusion is the same. So you wouldn't see it on just the diffusion weighted map. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about, we talked a little bit about how in every voxel we can have sort of like an ellipsoid that gives us the primary um, direction of diffusion. Okay. And so that's based on that principal eigenvector. So that tells you the principal diffusion direction. Okay. And so what's typically done is we'll color code that. And so for example, green will be diffusion that's primarily going along this direction. Red is primarily diffusion going this way. And um, blue is diffusion going into the thing. So basically if I look at this image, this means along this part of the brain, the fibers are running up and down, superior to inferior. This part of the brain where it's crossing, obviously it's going left to right, also left to right here. And then you've got the green fibers going anterior to posterior, okay? So this is something where um, once again, um, if someone has an issue, so this is like a healthy looking person which has fibers, the blue remember is running into the plane. Um, and then the green are ones running sort of anterior to posterior. I think in this example, they're highlighting this subject here has um, a lot of um, sort of fibers running here on the right hemisphere, but they weren't able to see anything on the left hemisphere. So indicating there's something going on here where the fibers have been uh, either displaced or, or, or somehow in, damaged on, on the left side of the brain. Okay. Okay, so the last thing we're going to do today is DTI tractography which is essentially uh, to first order you can think of as just like following the lines, okay? So if I have all these lipsoids, I can just sort of say, well, what's gonna be the path that sort of follows the direction of diffusion, okay? And if you do that, you can come up with what are called uh, fiber track maps. And so this is saying that this is what we think the fibers in the brain look like. Um, and essentially the key is you sort of have to pick a seed voxel and you sort of go and ask, you follow these ellipsoids and you sort of see where they end up, okay? The problem is that so far, what we've talked about can't handle crossing fibers. Like let's say you have, right now we only have one principal uh, direction in every vector, in every voxel, right? Because we just have that principal eigenvector. But what, have you, what happens if you have two fibers crossing? Then you can have diffusion this way and this way. So with just one, you know, maybe the estimate's gonna be like this. So you're gonna be confused, right? So that that 
that has been uh, a topic of great interest um, as people try to make this more clinically relevant. And so the solution is, instead of just acquiring seven measurements or directions, you got to acquire a lot of directions. And you're going to try to fully characterize how diffusion goes in different directions. And if you do that, let's say you have a fiber that's pointing like this way, then you also apply at different directions and different V values. And you can sort of see there, you end up with different shaped, uh, what are called peanuts, which are showing you uh, the strength of diffusion in every voxel, okay? And so here, uh, it's a little confusing, but essentially, if the primary direction of diffusion is this way, then the signal is weakest. This is a polar map. It's weakest at this theta, and it's strongest on opposite sides, okay? But it's just showing you that you can actually get, if you do enough measurements, enough angles, you can start getting characterizing the shape of these, and then you can undo those shapes and figure out which where there are crossing fibers and try to estimate, for example, if I have two fibers crossing, then I should get a shape like this, okay? But I can only do that if I acquire enough directions, right? If I only acquire a few directions, I'm not gonna be able to characterize that intricate shape, okay? So if you do that, then in every voxel, you know, you can sort of start resolving these crossing fibers. And so if you come to a voxel where there's a major juncture, then all of a sudden you can say, well, these fibers went through this way and this fiber went that way. Okay, and that becomes really important because there are a lot of crossing fibers in your brain. And if you zoom in on this, you can sort of see that what they've done is every voxel now, you know, has a very complicated shape. It's no longer the diffusion ellipsoid. It's really trying to resolve multiple directions, right? And so if you do that, then you can get what's, these are from the Human Connectome Project. Uh, I think I showed you to these on the first lecture, but uh, I think these are still pretty stunning images. And, and this is even done, you know, 10 years ago. So what we can do now is even better, but essentially, uh, and there's no, as we said before, there's no other technique that I know of that can actually do this in a living subject. Even if you gave me a dead subject, you can't really do this with any other technique in eight minutes, okay? So essentially you're getting these amazing tracks, maps of your fibers in your brain. And if I, if you're willing to lie still for 25 minutes, you can sort of see you're getting even more detail, okay? So I think this is one case where um, you could argue that there are certain things that other modalities can do, but as far as I know, uh, MRI is the only thing that can do this as of now, okay? In this amount of time with this amount of resolution, okay? And so the last slide I'm gonna show for today is sort of this interesting, uh, so, and because it's totally non-invasive, you can even apply this to populations that, you know, from an ethical point of view, you can inject, you know, contrast agents into a baby or anything like that, right? But you can do this in, in babies. Um, and so, for example, this is looking from two weeks to one year to two years. And um, if you looked at the fiber track map from two weeks to one year to an adult, in this case, you can sort of see the main thing is your brain just getting more and more wired up with experience and, and, and development. Okay. Um, and so this is sort of of great interest to people studying human brain development in the sense that, you know, um, if there's injury or some other disease, you know, how does it affect this wiring process? Okay. So clearly, as, as most of you know, from two weeks to one year is a really important time, but even in, 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 you know, probably up to four or five years, there's a lot of wiring of the brain that has to go on. Okay. And so with diffusion imaging, you're able to actually study that. All right, so I think that's the last slide I have for today. We're almost at the end of time. So are there any questions before we end? Yes. Sorry, can you say that again? Oh, what do the colors represent? Um, that's a good question. I'd have to look at the, the paper. Um, Yeah, um, I'll I'll look it up and and I'll I'll get you an answer. We'll have an answer to you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it just it's a it's definitely a pretty picture. I'm sure the colors have some meaning. It, it may indicate how how strong they think. Probably it's how anisotropic it is in those those fibers. But I have to look it up. Okay. Okay. Anything else before we end for today? Okay. If not, I'm going to stop the recording, and I'll be around to answer questions on. Um,
I guess there is one last homework, but it's fairly easy. And then uh, can answer questions on the project as well. Okay.